begin uh, just by giving some background into the Adams family, and then I'll introduce uh, Reverend McKechnie. Um, let me start first with the uh, first Adams to come here to Medfield, and that would be he and his great-great-grandfather, and that would be Henry Adams. And Henry Adams was born in England uh, in 1604, came first to Braintree, and then on out here to Medfield. Now, he was killed in the uh, Native American attack on the town, and he lived down on, uh, as you know, on Elm Street, right at the bend by, uh, by Millbrook. And as the story goes, um, his mill across the street, he owned that first mill here in Medfield. When the mill went up into flames, he came out uh, to his door, and he was shot uh, and killed in the doorway. Uh, his, his sons uh, made it safely into the woods, and, and they survived. Now, his wife, uh, Elizabeth, she was Elizabeth Payne of Braintree. Um, she was sent the week before uh, to um, Reverend Wilson's house. Now, Reverend Wilson's house would be where the town hall is today, and she was sent there for safety. And the irony is she ends up dying by friendly fire. Uh, one of the soldiers uh, from Boston were down in the basement and accidentally discharged his gun. The ball, she was asleep on the floor. The ball went up through the ceiling into her back, killing her uh, on that day of the attack. So she actually dies of friendly fire. He shot and killed uh, in the doorway. Um, he also uh, was the principal military officer of the town. He was selectman here in Medfield, and he was representative in the general court for many, many years. And he was also one of the founders of the town of Sherbin from Medfield. And then to the next generation, his son, or Hannah Adams' great-grandfather, also named Henry, was born in Medfield in 1657, dies here in 1733. He also lived in the original site. The house was rebuilt because it was burnt during the attack. Um, he marries Prudence Freire of Medfield in 1679. He is the first town treasurer in Medfield. He's town clerk here for many years. He was selectman for 13 years, and he was representative of the general court for 13 years. Um, his son, or Hannah Adams' grandfather, his name was Thomas, and he was born here in Medfield in 1688. He dies in 1763. Now, he moved down the street um, to what is now the South Plain Farm, uh, where the Sullivan family lives, and we have photos of that house over on the display table over there. Uh, he marries uh, Mary Ellis of Medfield, and he becomes one of the largest landowners uh, in the town of Medfield. So he begins to develop some wealth. Um, and then his son, or Hannah Adams' father, also named Thomas, was born here in Medfield in 1725. He dies in 1812, and he lived on the South Plain homestead. He marries Elizabeth Clark of Medfield in 1750. She dies in 1767. He remarries the following year Sarah Harris of Walpole, uh, and he was one of ten children. And then we have Hannah Adams being born here in Medfield in 1755. On the display table, you'll notice, um, first of all, the large frame on the left is from the Boston Antoneum. And on their anniversary, uh, they put together the different um, uh, pictures and uh, engravings uh, that they have. So along with Benjamin Franklin, along with George Washington, who's who of the Boston literary world, you see the painting to the right, hanging there in the Boston Antoneum, uh, of Hannah Adams. Um, so at this time, uh, it gives me uh, a great pleasure uh, to introduce um, Reverend Bob McKechnie, who's been very generous um, with his time. Um, Bob, first of all, is a lover of American history in particular, genealogies. And he really got involved into genealogies back in um, 1987 when he tried to learn um, the Native American heritage of his grandmother. And he got anybody that's get into genealogy, you know, it's like being a detective. And the more you get involved, the deeper and deeper you get. 
uh, and he became a frequent flyer over at places like the National Archives over in Waltham. Uh, this is Reverend McKechnie's eighth year here in the First Parish um, Universalist Unitarian Church. Uh, before coming to Medfield, uh, Bob was in the Unitarian Church in Lexington, Massachusetts. He was ordained in the year 2000 uh, from the Andover Newton Theology School. Uh, and before that, for 14 years, he worked with the old NCR, which later become, became AT&T. Uh, Bob has spent many, many hours reading and researching the writings and life of Hannah Adams, uh, including a great deal of time that he spent in at the Harvard Library, which has all the literary works of Hannah Adams. Uh, he also has the power to make it snow. <laughs> for the past two Mondays in a row. Uh, so I'm very honored to introduce to you Reverend Bob McKechnie. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here finally to talk about Hannah. I got a call, um, I don't know, maybe two and a half or three years ago from someone at the Hannah Adams Society here in Medfield, and they said, we understand you're the expert on Hannah Adams. Would you come talk to us about Hannah Adams? And I said, you know, I am not the expert on Hannah Adams. What I am is the person who wishes they were the expert on Hannah Adams. <laughs> and I said, in order to become an expert on Hannah Adams, one would have to put in hundreds of hours. And last year, fortunately, uh, I had a sabbatical, and I put about 100 hours into Hannah. And so this is the result of that. However, I want you to understand the very first thing I learned uh, when I got interested in genealogy at the Dallas Genealogical, Genealogical uh, Library um, was that you shouldn't take for granted anything anybody ever tells you about history. The only way you can know it's true is to corroborate it three times. And being a history teacher, you'd probably tell your students the same or something similar. So I present Hannah tonight in the hopes that you will critique her in future years not say this has to be true because this guy who studied a hundred hours of her whose name we don't even remember anymore uh, told us so. <laughs> if you find mistakes in my work, good! That's how, that's how you learn about, that's how we'll learn about Hannah Adams. That's how we'll keep her alive. And um, frankly, by questioning a few things, um, we can uh, learn what really truly is accurate. The other thing is, as I present her, I obviously am presenting things that struck me about her. I can't present her, in, her entirely. It would be here for hours and hours and hours. And even in the words I use, you might hear something that I didn't hear. And that has a lot to do with your own personal experience um, and your own personal lives when you try to connect with somebody from the long past. So I invite you to try to get to know Hannah um, a little more personally. There are plenty of resources for Hannah um, fortunately, uh, being an ordained minister from Andover Newton, um, I'm, I have access to the Harvard Andover Library, and that's where I was able to get copies of um, all of her works. And also, I noticed that Google is now putting her stuff out. So you can get her autobiography tonight by printing it off online if you want to. It's there. And uh, so is her Compendium of World Religions which is uh, a book I'm going to talk a lot about. Also, there, is, um, there are papers on Hannah at the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston, at the uh, Schlesinger Library, Radcliffe College in Cambridge, and at the Handel, uh, Harvard Andover Library, as I, uh, where I spent most of my time looking. OK, so I always approach history from genealogy first. Richard fortunately went through all the genealogy in much more detail than I'm going to. I'm going to simply say that uh, in, the, in the interest of, um, of uh, studying Hannah, I went to the, um, uh, the National Archives in Waltham, and I looked at a whole bunch of microfiche, and I followed the Adamses the best I could, and actually corroborate um, all of Tilden's dates except for one, and uh, that could just be, um, well, that could just be uh, a mistake on my part or Tilden's, and I'll explain what I'm talking about, because the microfiche is just <laughs> the way it is. But Hannah was born of Thomas Adams, uh, 1725, and he was born of Thomas Adams, 1688. You notice I go backwards, 
as opposed to Richard Goes Forwards, I noticed. Um, the 1688 Thomas was the son of Han uh, Henry Adams, 1657, and uh, the 1657 Henry was the son of Henry Adams, who was born in Somersetshire, England. And um, I believe that Tilden has his date as uh, 1604, but I would argue that it was 1609, but why split hairs over five years when we're talking about the early 1600s? But I think I see the reason why Tilden would have thought 1604, because when you look at the way it's written on the census, you know how a nine can look like a four if it's not closed? And so my opinion was that it was a nine, not a four, but that's a small thing. Okay, let's talk about Hannah. She was born on October 2nd, 1755 in Medfield, daughter of Thomas and Elizabeth Clark Adams. She was a Unitarian Christian, arguing that with regard to the warmly agitated academic disputes over matters of religion, after careful examination of the New Testament, with, I think, a sincere and ardent desire to know the truth, I give preference to the Unitarians." End quote. Hannah had a sister two years older than her named Betty, who she dearly loved, and we'll speak more about her shortly. There had been another Hannah that was born to Thomas and Elizabeth, but she was born and died in the same year, 1751. Following Hannah came Lucy, Lewis, and Newton. There were additional four children born to Thomas' second wife, Sarah Harris, but by that time, Hannah herself was over 18. The importance of her life has been grossly understudied and indeed under-celebrated as she was a woman who was remarkable for her time. And she has left behind a legacy that is not completely understood. Hannah's father, according to Hannah, imbibed a love of literature and prepared to enter the university. But as his constitution then appeared to be very infirm and he was an only son, his parents were strenuously opposed to his leaving them. Accordingly, to his inexpressible disappointment, he was obliged to settle upon their large farm. This is Hannah's father we're talking about. Without a sustainable knowledge of or taste for agricultural spirits, she wrote. He made his living by opening a shop of English imported goods and books. He was, in spite of his lack of university, an extremely well-read man, and he became proficient in Latin and Greek. Now hang on to that fact because that becomes important to Hannah's story in just a few minutes. In Hannah's autobiography published in 1832, just following her death in December of 1831, she gives us this glimpse of herself. From my infancy, I had a feeble constitution, she wrote. In particular, an extreme weakness and irritability in my nervous system. Hence, I can recollect uneasiness and pain previous to any pleasurable sensations. I would take from that that she meant that as far back as she could remember in her life, she had uh, considerable discomfort. She goes on to say, my father's circumstances then appeared affluent and, uh, and it was not supposed I should be reduced to the necessity of supporting myself by my own exertions. Partly from ill health and an early singularity of taste, I took no pleasure in the amusements to which children generally much attached. Hannah's health issues kept her from going to school with other children in Medfield, but as she was reflecting on this fact as a 76-year-old, that's how old she was when she was writing her autobiography, I believe she felt that she was better off not attending the schools when she was a child because they offered a far limited and inferior education than the standard of education she had set for herself. Here is what she had to say about it. The country schools at the time were kept but a few months in the year, and all that was taught in them was reading, writing, and arithmetic. In the summer, the children were instructed by the females in reading, sewing, and other kinds of work. The books chiefly made use of were the Bible and the Psalter. Those who have had the advantages of receiving the rudiments of their education at the schools of the present day, now remember she's writing this in the 1830s, of the present day, she can scarcely form an adequate idea of the contrast between them and those of an earlier age and of the great improvements which have been made even in the common country schools. 
I find that amazing since Richard wasn't even a part of the school yet, <laughs> uh, that it had such great improvement. The disadvantages of my early education I have experienced during life and among various others the acquiring of a very faulty pronunciation. A habit contracted so early that I cannot wholly rectify it in years later. I would say that this allocution problem that Hannah had so affected her entire life because she would not go out in public, she would not get to know other people because she was so self-conscious about the way she spoke. And uh, I would say maybe she overcame it to a certain point when she got to be a woman of 45 or 50, but certainly not as a young person. A certain picture of young Hannah is beginning to emerge for us. Her father, a scholarly introverted type who was never seen without a book in his hands. Hannah the same way, reading profusely but alone, not reading aloud in a classroom setting which would have improved her diction, not getting up in front of a class which would have improved her confidence, alone and becoming at this point in her life a recluse. But as she lets us know, not an unhappy recluse. She wrote, in my early years I was extremely timid and averse from appearing in company. Indeed, I found but few with whom I would happily associate. <coughs> my life, however, was not devoid of enjoyment. The first strong propensity of my mind, which I can recollect, was an ardent curiosity and desire to acquire knowledge. I remember that my first idea of the happiness of heaven was of a place where we should find our thirst for knowledge fully gratified. From my predominant taste, I was induced to apply to reading, and as my father had a considerable library, I was engaged to gratify my inclination. So Hannah goes on to say of herself that though she was passionate about reading novels and poetry, especially works by Milton, Thompson, and Young, which she put to memory, she acquired many false ideas about life and the world. The ideal world, she wrote, which my imagination formed was very different from the real. I acquired false ideas of life because I lived in seclusion. Hannah's early life was not without its painful moments. Her mother died when, as Hannah says it, Hannah was in her tenth year. That is another difference from Tilden. I believe he calls her a 12-year-old. So there's a question about the year that Hannah's mother died. She says she's in her 10th year. That makes her nine years old, right? So that's a three-year difference. I don't really know. That's something that would have to be corroborated. Understand that though it's a minor point, the year of Elizabeth Clark Adams' death is supposed to be 1767, and that is not corroborated by Hannah herself. Hannah said of her mother, my mother was an excellent woman and deservedly esteemed and beloved. But as her own health was delicate, she, was possessed great, she possessed great tenderness and sensibility. I was educated in all the habits of debilitating softness, which probably added to my want of bodily and mental firmness. Realize now that this is my opinion, but what I hear is a remarkable self-reflection on Hannah's part. Hannah seems to say, my mother meant well and was very compassionate of me and my infirmities, but her softness towards me was debilitating. And I became more and more inclined to make something of myself to overcome that debilitating love that my mother was giving me. She was like overprotecting me in a sense. And of course, Hannah did overcome it. Speaking of her mother again, Hannah wrote, when her death took place, I was at an age when maternal direction is of the greatest importance, particularly in the education of daughters. And soon after, I was bereaved of an aunt who was attached to me with almost maternal fondness. That is so sad. She loses her mother. She clings to an aunt who she doesn't name. I'm assuming it's the mother's sister, but I don't really know that. And uh, a year, two years, we don't really know. She says, soon after. This aunt dies. Another painful time in Hannah's youth came about when she was a middle teen, 14 to 15 years old. Her father's business failed. The consequence of such was that Hannah found herself mired in poverty. She wrote of this time, instead of gaiety, which is often attendant on youth, I was early accustomed to scenes of melancholy 
and distress. My life passed in seclusion with gloomy prospects before me and surrounded with various perplexities from which I could not extricate myself. The solitude, I wit the solitude in which I lived was, however, to me, preferable to society in general and to that and to my natural singularity I must impute that awkwardness of manners of which I never could divest myself in an advanced period of life. You see how self-conscious she is. She's expressing her self-consciousness. A consciousness of this awkwardness produced a dislike to the company of strangers. Those who have been accustomed to general society when young can scarcely imagine the trembling timidity I felt when introduced to my superiors in circumstances and education. Hannah said that she could never have made it through this period of her life without her sister Betty. Betty was described by Hannah to be similar in sentiment but very different in disposition. Hannah wrote, I was warm and irritable in my temper. She, placid and even. I was fluctuating and undecided. She, steady and judicious. I was extremely timid. She, blended softness with courage and fortitude. I was inclined to be melancholy, though sometimes in high spirits. She was uniformly serene and cheerful. I placed strong reliance upon her judgment, and as she was older than myself, she seemed the maternal friend, as well as the best of all sisters. In short, she was my guide, my friend, my earthly all. Okay, for tonight's purposes, that is all I'm going to say about Hannah's genealogy, <clears throat> her family and self-portrait of her youthful self. I'm now going to move to Hannah to about 20 years old, 1775, the outbreak of the American Revolution and the beginning of Hannah's professional pursuits, bearing in mind that her education never comes to an end. We are about to be introduced to the many firsts that Hannah has given us Americans. At 20 years of age, Hannah comes in contact with some young seminarians that Harvard has sent to her father for what was called rustification. It was not unusual in those days for a very bright student to be sent to seminary at about 14 years old. But what do you do with a 17-year-old when he's mastered theology, philosophy, medicine, astronomy, <laughs> you name it, chemistry, you can simply ordain him and put him in a parish, but that usually didn't work out because these smart young boys weren't mature enough. So Harvard sent them to Thomas Adams in Medfield for rustification, as they called it, for continued study and for work of the real life on a big farm. They had to grow up. And so Hannah saw these young seminarians all the time living in her house. And Hannah says that until these young men came to her home, she had almost exclusively engaged in the reading of novels and poetry, what she called works of imagination and feeling. She claimed to have been a complete stranger to the works of controversy, works that brought disputed issues to the forefront for resolution. Well, works of dispute were all that these young men read. They were constantly discussing every conceivable point of dispute between the different denominations of Christianity. Hannah wrote, while I was engaged in learning Latin and Greek, one of the gentlemen who taught me had by him a small manuscript from the Broughton's Dictionary, giving an account of Armenians, Calvinists, and several other denominations, which were most common. This awakened my curiosity, and I assiduously engaged myself in perusing all the books which I could obtain, which gave an account of these various sentiments described. I soon became disgusted with the want of candor in the authors I consulted, in giving the most unfavorable descriptions of denominations they disliked, and applying them to the names of heretics and fanatics and enthusiasts. So each author she read only claimed that their religion was the one that everyone else should follow, and everyone else was a lunatic. <laughs> Some things never change. 
It is in this passage that we witness just how remarkable Hannah Adams was. The seeds are now planted in her being for the message that she wants to share with the world, and she spends her whole life doing it. The message was of religious pluralism. It might be argued that she was the first person in America to truly understand what religious pluralism actually is. Religious pluralism now in the 21st century is not given the respect that Hannah realized that it was due in the 18th century. Religious pluralism, by definition, requires one to see that religions other than their own uh, can be legitimate, can have a legitimate path to salvation. This is not the same as religious tolerance. This is not saying, I will tolerate you as a person even though I know your understanding of God is all wrong. It's the ability to say that I understand that your path to God can be simultaneous and equally legitimate as my path. Imagine this woman in the 18th century coming to this realization and understanding that no one else in the world understands that and writes a book about it <laughs> and tries to preach it all over. Hannah was angry that when she read the description of a given religion in the books of her day, she was finding that they were always written by an author with a self-serving agenda, by an author who had no personal experience of the other's faith, by an author that knew in his heart his was the only true religion. To make this known to the world, Hannah hatches a plan, as she called it. I therefore formed a plan for myself, she wrote. I made a blank book and I wrote the rules for transcribing and adding to my compilation. Her rules included the desire to only record in her book what a person would say about their own religion. And she required herself to put the manuscript on hold several times because she felt that her own bias of religious belief would color the representation of a religion she was trying to describe on its own merit. Hannah wrote, reading so much religious controversy must be extremely trying to a female whose mind, instead of being strengthened by those studies which exercise the judgment and give stability to the character, is debilitated by reading romances and novels, which are addressed to the fancy and the imagination and are calculated to heighten the feelings. Here we have Hannah introducing us to the importance of equal education of the sexes. All she read as a kid was poetry novels. But when she met these guys from Harvard, she knew she could keep up with them. And she goes, you, you guys are reading the real stuff, the real important controversial things, the things that make you think. And she's a woman who sees herself at a disadvantage because as a woman, she was not engaged in the type of education that would serve her in the task she now finds herself engaged in. So as Hannah had no funds to travel around the world, she needed access to a larger inventory of books than even she could imagine in order to bring together in one book every known religion of the world. Fortunately, what her father did not have in money, he had in connections. Hannah used every means available to her as she began to compile her book. In the meantime, as a quick but important aside, Hannah had a small interruption in her work. It was known as the American Revolution. Hannah wrote of this time, I was pressed by necessity to make every exertion in my power for my immediate support. During the American Revolutionary War, I learned to weave bobbin lace, which was then saleable and much more profitable to me than spinning or sewing or knitting, which had previously been my employment. So it's interesting what you can learn about the individual person when they don't realize that they're telling you what they did to, subs you know, to subsist. At this time, I found little time for literary pursuits. But at the termination of the American War, this resource failed, and I was again left in a destitute situation. Hannah goes on to describe that she wasn't healthy enough to take a full-time position teaching in school. But there were three gentlemen in the local area to which she could provide training in Greek and Latin so that they could prepare for college. While she was doing this, her sister Betty, who never married, went back to the conventional forms of knitting and sewing to bring in some income to the family. 
Hannah trudged on with her book, struggling to read and understand, read and understand. And finally, she reached a point where her book was uh, ready to be published. It was entitled An Alphabetical Compendium of the Various Sects Which Have Appeared in the World from the Beginning of the Christian Era to the Present Day. <laughs> Thanks to Elizabeth, I have a first edition copy of it. She put me in touch with this man who loves to buy and sell these old books. And um, the book was about a thousand dollars and I um, uh, wrote to a bunch of Unitarian Universalist ministers and religious educators and I told them about this opportunity to get this book and uh, they all sent me 25 bucks, 50 bucks and eventually I had a thousand dollars and the book is over there underneath <laughs> Hannah's picture. <laughs> the book's over there underneath Hannah's picture and it's going to work its way into uh, uh, probably a permanent place at the Arlington Street Church in Boston so that the Unitarian Universalist uh, children who participate in a program called Coming of Age, it's like what confirmation would be to a Catholic, um, when they take the tour in Boston and they learn all about Unitarian Universalists, they'll be taught about Hannah Adams. I should mention that you already have three copies of that book in your vault. I saw them. <laughs> After my uh, view of religions was prepared for the press, Hannah wrote, the difficulty still remained for finding any printer willing and able to print it without money immediately paid. But at length, after various perplexities, this compilation was put to press in 1784. The profit to myself was very small, for as it might well have been expected from my father's inexperience in the business of bookmaking, he was completely duped by the printer in making the bargain. After being at the trouble of procuring upwards of 400 subscribers, all the compensation I was able to obtain was only 50 books, and I was obliged to find a sale for them. Okay, so she pre-sold 400 books, and the printer got all that money. She was handed 50 books, um, and it was up to her to sell them. And that's all the payment she got. And I want to say that uh, being such a lady, in, in her autobiography, the way she actually wrote this was, all the compensation I was able to obtain was only 50 books, and I was obliged to find a sale for them. After the printer, whose name, out of respect for his descendants, I omit to mention. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, if that was one of us, we would have nailed that guy. We would have had his name in the paper three or four times a week. <laughs> I omit to mention, had received all the subscription money. As my book sold very well, the printer must have made something handsome by the publication. Now, it's important to understand that in those days there was no such thing as a federal copyright law. There was a law within Massachusetts that had just been passed the prior year, um, in 1783. But Mr. Adams didn't understand its significance. So when Hannah's father made the arrangements for the printing of Hannah's book, he unknowingly left the unnamed publisher with full permission to do reprints of the book. But, 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 don't underestimate Hannah now. <laughs> don't be all sighing and everything. <laughs> Hannah, through some friends, you see that picture over there that Richard already pointed out? Those were her friends at the, at the name there. And through those friends, she recognized the necessity of filing the proper paperwork to secure the copyright when they recognized how fast her book was selling. So one day, the publisher contacts Hannah to let her know he's about to, <laughs> he's about sold out of his 400 copies and he's about to reprint the book. He only contacted her to ask if there was anything she wished to add to the book. While Hannah, in contrast to her usual meek and politely Christian self, let that publisher know, in no uncertain terms, what she thought of him and that he would be sued if he didn't immediately turn over the design, as it was called. So the publisher did so. But Hannah, without resources, could not go back to the to press just yet, even though there was demand for the book. So Han Hannah enters a period in her life where she is exhausted, depressed, and impoverished. And she muddles along and credits a Dr. Mann from Rentham with the preservation of her life in this period. And then 
To add to her difficulties, her beloved sister Betty dies in 1789. And about this event, Han Hannah wrote, I was involved in the deepest affliction by the death of my beloved sister. I then experienced the keenest anguish the human heart can feel in losing a friend. And then she inserted this piece of poetry. Dearer than life or aught below the skies, the bright ideas and romantic schemes of perfect love and friendship fancy paints. In her, I realized. And is she dead? My life, my all is gone. The world a desert. Nothing now on earth can yield me joy or comfort. Everything appeared gloomy in my situation, Hannah goes on to say. My health was feeble. I was entirely destitute of property. My father's circumstances were very low, and I had no other relation or friend from whom I might expect assistance. Some future historian might pick up the history with that statement and find out where her brother was who inherited the house. <laughs> I sure would like to know. <laughs> and someday, maybe if I ever get another sabbatical, I'll find that out. <laughs> it was at this point that I determined to use every possible exertion to help myself awaken the activity of my mind and preserve me from sinking under the weight of affliction I sustained in losing the best of sisters. So Hannah set to work doing two things. First, she wrote to Congress in 1790, petitioning them to make a federal copyright law, which was adopted and passed into law. Another important contribution by Hannah. She authored the federal copyright law. And in 1791, she befriended the Reverend Mr. Freeman in Boston, who helped to secure an enormous number of subscribers for the reprinting of her book that she was planning. Mr. Folsom, the printer, noticed that she names him this time, must have been a nice guy, <laughs> made her a most advantageous contract. The second edition placed Hannah in what she called a comfortable position and enabled her to pay off all of the debts she incurred during her sister's illness with a little left over to put out a small sum upon interest. I guess that's what you said when you put it in the bank. <laughs> it is important to note here that this event in Hannah's life made her the very first woman in America to claim author as her sole means of making a living. So she may not have been the first female author, but she was the first female author that made a living writing. Hannah went on to write other important works, a summary history of New England in 1799, followed by a school text version in 1801, there are some of these books around with other titles, and I should tell you that a lot of the stuff she wrote was condensed by her and, uh, and sometimes by publishers with her permission into small textbook size books so kids could use them at school. And they didn't have to carry around these great big books with a whole bunch of information that you know, a fourth grader wouldn't understand. So sometimes you come across these same books and they have different titles and it's because you have the textbook version or the, you know, the school book version versus the original publication. So she wrote a summary history of New England, which we're going to talk a little bit more about in 1799, followed by a school text version in 1801. In 1804 she wrote, The Truth and Excellence of the Christian Religion Exhibited. Um, in 1812 she wrote The History of the Jews. 1824 she wrote Letters on the Gospel. And there were also further revisions of the World Religion Compendium, the last reprinted in 1817. The difficulties Hannah encountered while publishing the 1799 Summary History of New England bear our attention for a few moments. Do we have about five more minutes? Good. In the preparation of this, I was going to keep going anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, you know, hint, I, after you do this much research on Hannah, you have to be polite. <laughs> In the preparation of this book, the uh, Summary History of New England, Hannah realized that not a lot had been written about the state of Rhode Island, except for a book she referred to as Calendars, C-A-L-L-E-N-D-E-R-S. So she took herself down to Providence, the furthest she ever traveled, 
and worked tireless, tirelessly in the Office of Records, per perusing hundreds of documents that were difficult to read. Well, the result of this activity was that Hannah lost her eyesight. Now, I don't know in modern days what actually happened to her, whether she got cataracts or whatever, but this is how she described it. Now, whether she had some kind of eye infection or cataracts or macular degeneration, I cannot tell from her autobiography. <coughs> I only know this because she shared it with us. As I returned from Providence, I found my sight fail to the degree that I was obliged to lay aside reading, writing, and every employment which required the use of my eyes. At length, by the advice of Dr. Jeffries and by assiduously following his prescriptions, I partially recovered my eyesight after two years by applying laudanum, L-A-U-D-A-N-U-M, any pharmacists here that know what that is? Mm -hmm. Laudanum and seawater several times in the course of a day. For two years, I recovered so far as to resume my studies. That was the first of two challenges for Hannah in getting the summary history of New England published. The other was the Reverend Dr. Jedediah Morse. Now, if this was a movie and I said that name, you'd hear, bum, dum, dum. Because <laughs> he was a really mean guy. As I mentioned before, Hannah's 1799 book, A Summary History of New England, had a textbook companion for school children. Well, it seems that a controversy arose when two ministers with doctorates of divinity decided to take Hannah's 1799 book and create their own school text from it. Now, the Reverend Doctors Jedediah Morse and Parrish, was the other guy, were already making an income, according to Hannah, of between $1,500 and $2,000 each from their published books and were also collecting a salary from their congregations. They didn't need to go leeching off of her. That's how she felt. And so Hannah went to see Morse and complained that his school textbook looked a lot like her original text and that she was concerned that his pursuit of this topic would cut her out of the textbook market. Well, Morse smothered her with flattery and told her that her book was so far superior that her sales would never be affected. And Hannah wasn't happy. She didn't fall for that. And she let Morse know about it. And Morse and Parrish published their book anyway, and in the introduction of the book, they insulted the character of the work of Hannah Adams' summary history of New England. This really angered Hannah. To be told to her face that her work was superior and she shouldn't worry about his Morse's text only to have him deride the text in his preface. So Hannah knew she couldn't win in the academic world against these two giants of history and religion. They were both Harvard professors. So she pursued them personally. However, when she confronted Morse about the insults he had written against her work and threatened to sue, he told her to back off or he would make sure she never sold a single copy of the book he knew that she was working on regarding the history of the Jews. Well, for eight years, she waged a war of rhetoric with Morse. Eight years. This woman was persistent. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, the matter specifically uh, uh, to the charges, one of plagiarism and one of slander, was brought before a judge. And the judge found in favor of Hannah, which severely diminished Morse's reputation, but the judge never actually named an amount that Morse should repay Hannah. And so he never gave her a nickel. As you can well imagine, the rhetoric over this matter got quite nasty over time. Accusations and counter accusations were made in the public sphere. Hannah, wanting to keep the record straight, actually went to the trouble to record every detail of the eight years. Every detail of the affair. And it's in that book that I borrowed from you. <laughs> That one that I'm afraid that... Well, it's over there now. Right, but I don't want anyone to turn the pages. It's so fragile. Every conversation and letter from the controversy was published by Hannah in 1814 in a book entitled A Narrative of the Controversy of Jedediah Morse and the Author, Hannah Adams. And by the way, it's also free if you go out to Google. <laughs> type, type in the title. It's now there. See, uh, Google went over to, um, to the uh, Harvard... Andover Newton Library and has just started taking every book in their collection and putting it online. And all the Hannah Adams stuff is there. It's really cool. Hannah eventually struggled her way to such prominence in the academic world that she became the very first woman to be, how many times have I said that tonight? <laughs> she became the very first woman in the academic world um, 
to be invited to frequent the prestigious and close to women Athenaeum in Boston. Her friends among them, Josiah Quincy, Stephen Higginbottom, and William Shaw established a permanent annuity for her so she could live her final days in dignity in her Brookline apartment. Upon her death in 1831, she was scheduled to be the very first person interred at the beautiful Mount Auburn Cemetery. In fact, her headstone declares that she is the first interred at the Mount Auburn Cemetery. But as it happened, Hannah died on December 15th, after the ground was frozen. And so was the custom of the day. The bodies were sent indoors to holding places in the basements of nearby churches. And if my memory serves me right, when I went over to Mount Auburn and I asked them, they told me that Hannah had spent the winter in the basement of the Park Street Church on Tremont Street. But that's okay. They still hadn't buried anyone at Mount Auburn. But then springtime came and the ground thawed and before anyone went to retrieve Hannah, they buried eight other people. <laughs> so even though her stone says she's first, she's ninth. <laughs> but she's first in my book. <laughs> and so eight others were buried at Mount Auburn ahead of Hannah. And that's all I have to say tonight. <laughs>